Oh. So now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a man who hasn't made a picture in over a year and still thinks he's a movie star, <laughs> Jack Benny. <laughs> Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I don't know what brought the subject up, but it might interest you to know that you don't have to make a picture every five minutes to be considered a movie star. Well, Jack, I didn't mean that. You know, after all, Adolf Zucker, the head of Paramount, gave me a four-year contract. And Mr. Zucker certainly knows his onions. He certainly signs them up, too. Mary. <laughs> you don't come in till the next page. Oh. <laughs> I don't, you know, I record these and I don't know why I think these are funny until I'm listening to them again. Uh, but yeah, thanks out there. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hello again, this is Ben Hitchcock Cross talking to you today. Uh, we are going to do part two of uh, the Novak decision going through the facts here uh, still. And, um, you know, I can just give you some context. By the way, it's Thanksgiving. This case, this decision came out some months ago. We were still working through everything, and I know about if it happens to me and when I hear the verdict, it's kind of hard to follow up on the evidence, especially if it makes me, if I'm opposed to it or anything like that. So, um, you know, we waited for some time. Uh, I hope you appreciate that or are too livid about that fact, however you look at it. Um, but it, here we are. We're going through it, and um, there's a lot to say. There are also... I can tell you, and we're going to come up with as much of that as we can uh, this holiday weekend, is there was a lot of uh, things going on in the area of this uh, complaint and or decision here. And um, one of the things we'll get into later on, but there's a lot of other decisions. Um, I've never gotten so many decisions out of the Equal Rights Division uh, determinations, decisions, actions, somebody calling me up and saying that we I hadn't f filed a withdrawal like the next, I mean, and calling me day after day. Um, there was just a lot of, it seemed to me like there was a decision before and after this, a discussion about what the ERD was going to do about Ben Hitchcock Cross. And one of the things they thought was to clear all the decks, which is, you know, okay, but um, it was just the concerted action, the number of things, the number of people um, continuously contacting me. Uh, I won't say continuous. The number of people contacting me immediately after this decision came out um, was surprising. And I think that it had a lot to do with, um, you know, the sort of the fear and the, dis the, A, I think it signals that there's discussions going on there is it in a broader sense. Uh, at the Equal Rights Division about what's what to do as a policy matter and how to deal with this. And then I think there's also um, sort of a fear of what I'm going to do in response. And um, really what I think that is is that, and it's sort of an admission there, that um, they could be doing better to uh, follow the mission that they are statutorily required to follow, which is to work towards equal rights. Um, so I, I, they may be feeling to uh, whatever extent that um, we have shown, we are showing, have shown, continue to show them to be failing at that mission, um, which, you know, of course calls into question their existence and because uh, anything you don't do to a bureaucrat is do that. So um, that's where we're at. Thank you for <laughs> starting with that. Uh, here's our preamble. We're going to go hopefully... Bam, like clockwork, it's amazing. Straight over to uh, where we are here. So, uh, the last thing that we had read from last time was the judge saying that prior to the creation of internal affairs, the DOC, war, basically the wardens were the ones who were making the decisions about discipline, and that because that wasn't working, um, <clears throat> the DOC upper management was taking direct control of that. And again, uh, that's not the testimony that we heard. Um, and just to just to be clear, and I, I want to talk a little bit about discretion here and what a judge, what that means in terms of a decision. Okay, and this this is really any kind of judge that we're talking about in terms of fact finding. Okay, the judge 
basically has the discretion to pick sides. Okay, that means in fact that's what their job is. Okay, so let's say, and this is the easiest example. Let's say there's a collision. You say the light was green. They, the other guy says the light was red. The judge can say the light was red, and you lose. Perfectly acceptable behavior. Okay, why can the judge do that? Because if there's there has to be evidence that there was a light. And there has to be, meaning the, the intersection was controlled where the collision occurred. There was a light there. This is what we call a uh, controlled intersection, a light a intersection controlling device. And that uh, there was a dispute about how it was uh, lit and when. Okay, so we're going to go to the judge to figure that out. So if there's evidence in the record that says there's a light and that says somebody says it's green and somebody says it's red, then the judge gets to pick which one does that. But if there's no evidence in the record of any, you know, that, that it's not a controlled intersection, let's say that everybody says that there's no stop sign and no stoplight of any kind, the judge cannot put in there that the stoplight was green. Can't do it. Can't put in their stoplights red. That does, the judge doesn't have the discretion, the power, the ability to decide things, decide on evidence that's not before so, you know, the judge does, judges do have a lot of power. And I know that that's a lot of what, when we're watching, um, you know, courtroom proceedings, a lot of what people like to see are the power of the judges. But they're also very limited. They have discretionary authority, but only for limited purposes. Because that's part of a system of government that involves checks and balances means that everybody who has given power by the government, by the people, whoever it is, has a limitation, an express limitation, meaning we should know what the limits of their power are. Same thing with the judge. Okay? And that's, the judges are even more so the case because unlike the executive, unlike the king, right, the king throughout all, the, much of recorded history, we'll put it like that, had the power of the church and behind it, okay? That they had the power of custom, they had the power um, going back. I mean, I, we don't need to go into a history lesson, but there was a lot of normative power saying what the king does is right. And in fact, it's blessed by God. It's blessed. Uh, it's the, he's the emperor. It comes from Rome. But however you want to express it, that basically that it is right and it is the law that this one person can make whatever rule they want to. Okay? That's the case. In contradistinction the courts have usually been extremely limited in their powers. A couple of reasons for that. Number one is because they're necessarily competing with the Lord or the executive power, who is, you know, completely unfettered. Um, that, by the way, is a complete misnomer to say... Um, you know, that the executive has always been unfettered. It, in fact, it's, you know, uh, waxed and waned, uh, come and gone throughout time. But uh, the power of the judiciary, starting especially with Rome here, has always been, and that's a lot of what sovereign citizens are latching on to, is that the judiciary has always had more or less express powers. Um, meaning that there was courts in equity that they could do they could use equitable relief to fashion a remedy to solve these issues but only on very minor things right and and you have to remember under english law anything there was so many different kinds of church uh, courts so to have a court that we're talking about that's just court in equity dealing with so and so owes this many bushels of grain to so and so on a default contract that as is alleged okay that is a court then you have another kind of court altogether for barons for ecclesiastes for church matters for all sorts of different matters to decide the question is who is the one who gets to decide that uh is the light red or is the light green okay and throughout much of history there's been these independent power bases that are too powerful for a king or whatever else to say, I'm going to impose this court on you to make this decision. And then we look back 
on another completely different level, which is the criminal courts. And for the most part, the criminal courts throughout history have basically been uh, whatever the king says it is, or if there's a municipality, whatever the rulers of the city happen to say is a municipal court, is the courts and the, the system of justice. And it more so has depended on, um, you know, a question. This is why due process is always so important because it's what the, you know, the oligarchs of the city, what the king, whatever they crime that they want to be deterring, right, whatever issues that they're worried about, you know, because, of course, they're going to be worried about vagabonds and bandits and not lords, you know, robbing peasants, for example, right? So they're going to be focused on those kind of crimes. And um, the question then is, you know, pushing back throughout history is what are the due process? What do we need so that that is, what are the limits on that power? Okay. Broadly speaking here, that's why we're talking about, oh my gosh, and I've been you haven't, you're <laughs> sitting here with this paragraph in front of me the whole time as I'm going off on a lecture of history with the courts. Um, my point again is there's a reason why the courts have a very limited um, and expressly limited power throughout time that's been the case. Um, in our sort of modern system of government, the executive, the legislature, all these branches of government that we have all have different various limits on them. Um, but the, the court system has always been, because they've been individualized courts, has always been um, limited. Because just for example, the king could never bring a, po a bishop to justice, as they say. Right? A king could bring his serfs to justice all day long. A city could bring its you know, burghers, its uh, vagrants, its whatever to justice, no problem. But a city can't go in and um, do something against the Lord in another location. That would never, they don't have the, the jurisdiction, the competency to do that. That's a lot of where that historical concept comes from. Okay? Bam, here we are. So, um... The point of all of this is, is that when we're looking at this lens, of uh, we're reviewing this decision, we have to say, does this court have the authority to put this down? Meaning, was there facts that were put in front of it? And you all witnessed those facts because you saw the, the hearing. Was there adequate foundation in the hearing? Can she point to anything that says, this is what's true? And I think for a lot part that not only... Is there a question of five people saying it and one person says it? But I think there's five people say that uh, this is not, I mean, this might have been on the page, just for example, but then everybody else says this, including the decision makers, say, no, that's not what's happening. Then she has to be able to say that, okay, we're, I'm going to, <clears throat> in that case, what you would expect is a judge to say, okay, so and so says this, and the but the page says this, and although five people and the decision maker who's actually in charge say you know X, the page says Y, so we're going to go with what the page says. Okay, you would expect them to say to at least be clear on that, but here they're just saying, hey, whatever it's the page is, or again in our first example, there is a light that's controlling the the stoplight is green, uh, but in fact there's no stoplight at all. Okay. 13. In late uh, 2019, Lucas Weber, a male, was CCI's deputy warden, and Brian Gusky, a male, was CCI's security director. As the deputy warden and the security director at CCI, respectively, Weber and Gusky were the two next highest ranking officials after Novak. If Novak was not present, then Weber was in charge of CCI. If Novak and Weber were not present, etc. Okay? As career executives, Novak, Weber, and Gusky could be reassigned to each other's position if deemed necessary with or without their permission. Keep that in mind for future reference. <clears throat> the one thing I really want to highlight with this paragraph here is that when I've been dealing with this judge in the past, if we're talking about a correctional officer <coughs> who's a female and a correctional sergeant is a male, for example, just for comparison, she will not allow that comparison at all. 
and will say that they're completely different, even though a sergeant has is basically a work leader and has no supervisory authority of any kind. And the law, specifically both on Lurk and at the Seventh Circuit, meaning the federal level, are pretty clear that it's not identical positions. Equivalency is, I think, the key word here. So now we're sort of talking about male, 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 um, to set up a broader, broader issue. As the warden at CCI, Novak reported Douglas Percy, a division of adult institutions, assistant administrator. Percy was one of the two assistant administrators for the DAI. The other one was Stephanie Hovey, a female. Completely irrelevant about Stephanie Hovey. Percy and Hovey were located at Madison. Percy and Hovey wrote, reported to Fessahaya. Why, again, is there any mention of Hovey has no... She, like, took a telephone call at the beginning of the escape. That's the sole connection that she has with this case. We'll see how many times her name comes up. Reported to the DAI administrator, the wardens from 10 Wisconsin Correctional Institutions reported to Percy. The other wardens reported to Hovey. Although Novak reported to Percy, Fessahaya was the appointing authority for Novak. As the appointing authority for Novak, Fessahaya was responsible for making hiring disciplinary and termination decisions for Novak with input from human resources personnel and others. <laughs> That's not unconscious. Pursuant to DOC policies and the actual practice, Judge, thanks for putting that part in there, of uh, her not doing anything except but within consultation with uh, Mr. Percy. I mean, that's that statement. Fessahaya was responsible for making hiring disciplinary and termination decisions for Novak with input from human resources personnel and others pursuant to DOC policy. <coughs> the reason that that can't be supported by the record is the DOC policies say that, but everybody else says that that's not what the practice was. That's the issue. So when you say she was responsible pursuant to the policies, that might in itself be true to a certain extent. Okay, so does that mean she can say it? But it's absolutely leading out what is the crucial fact here. In November, there was a serious attack on a correctional officer at CCI, and the warden at CCI, as the warden, recommended to the DOC Secretary's Office through Percy that CCI be locked down. While that attack was investigated, the inmates involved identified identified inappropriate measures taken to assure the future safety of the staff and the inmates. That wasn't really testified to at all. A lockdown is a serious step because it means inmates are generally kept in their cells and cannot have any visitors. Secretary Carr supported Novak's request to lock down CCI in November and December, despite complaints from advocacy groups for the inmates and their families about the lockdown. Sometime in January of 2020, the lockdown at CCI ended. The problem with that sentence is it doesn't say anything about who initiated the lockdown, right? Everything before that is active, 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 and then all of a sudden it's passive. Sometime it just happened. Whoops. <laughs> because the members of the public were unhappy about the lockdown at CCI in November and December of 2019, <coughs> Secretary Carr had a meeting on or about January 22nd of 2020 with the advocacy groups for the inmates and their families. At that meeting with Carr, the advocacy group's participant expressed their anger about the lockdown and asked that Novak be fired. During the meeting, Carr support, expressed support for Novak. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's as far as I recall, it says that he wouldn't hesitate to fire her if he found her breaking breaking a rule. But okay. This is, 
the point. Car, the express that car express support for Novak. Okay. So that's true, according to her. After the meeting, the advocacy flyer about Secretary Carr uh, was widely distributed. Based on the account in the flyer that Novak read, Novak believed that Carr had not expressed support for Novak in the meeting with the advocacy groups. Novak understood that Carr had stated that Carr would not hesitate to fire Novak if she broke the rules. Novak was very upset about what she believed Secretary Head Carr had said about in the meeting about firing people without any discussion of progressive discipline, consistent <clears throat> discipline and employee rights. Novak took Carr's reported comments very personally and was very concerned about Carr's view of her work. Generally, Novak did not have much direct contact with Carr. That was kind of strange sentence to put on there. Generally, Novak did not have much direct contact with Carr, but she clearly did have contact with Carr that they met, but we'll just see what, I guess that's, we'll see what happens. In a meeting with Secretary Carr during the lockdowns and in a discussion with Fessahaye in early February of 2020, Novak made statements that Carr and Fessahaye uh, believe that Novak was not happy in her position as the warden at CCI. Since a warden at another institution was retiring, there was an opportunity to shift some DOC personnel to new position and move Novak to a medium. security institution which is a less stressful position than being the warden at a maximum security position if there's no mention here of uh him saying both of them saying that she was emotional that's a big problem because that was one of the key pieces of evidence that came out in this hearing about this meeting and novak made statements wow is that your recollection of what happened it, about your description of that meeting and as uh, described there in paragraph 18? Let me know. I'd love to hear all about it. <clears throat> On February 26, 2020, a memorandum was sent to Mac, uh, Malika uh, Vanco, an administrator of the Division of Personnel Management, requesting authority to reassign six career executives. We've all seen that document. The reassignments of the six career executive DLC were announced on March 11, 2020, and were become effective on April 20th, 2020. Okay, but then, of course, it didn't happen. Okay, under the career executive rules, career executive assignments are permanent voluntary appointment of a career executive within the agency under yada, 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 yada. Since the memorandum involved career executive re reassignments had to be approved by the BMRS director, in advance of the reassignment due to some statute that allows career executives who have been reassigned to appeal the reassignment to the Wisconsin Employment Relations Commission if the career assignment uh, choose to do so. But everybody approved of that, and they all knew it. Okay. Where is this testimony coming from? Let's read this and then we'll finish on this. But if you can point to me, anybody can point to me where this testimony is coming from, I would appreciate that. Um, and I'll point, tell you where. When the reassignments were announced on March 11th, Fessahaya met with each of the career executives who had been reassigned to tell each person of their reassignment. Besides Fessahaya, both of the assistant DAI administrators, Percy and Hovey, were present for the meetings in which the employees were told of the employees' reassignment to a new position. In the meeting with Novak, Novak was happy about her reassignment to be the warden at Red Granite because Red Granite was closer to her home because she was in a medium security prison. Okay. Despite being happy, that all seems to jive with my recollection. Despite being happy about the reassignment to Red Granite, Novak was concerned that the reassignment might be because Fessahaya, Percy, and Hovey were unhappy with Novak's performance at CCI. In the meeting, Novak asked Fessahaya if Fessahaya and her assistants were dissatisfied with Novak's performance as the warden at CCI, and Fessahaya said that she was not dissatisfied with Novak's performance at CCI, 
In the meeting, Novak was assured that Novak was doing a good job about CCI and that Novak had done what they wanted her to do at CCI, but they wanted to put Novak in a position where her strengths with her social work background and program background could be used. Again, there's no mention of the emotional comment. Uh, Novak was reassigned to Red Gramet without any change in pay. Novak would not be required to serve the probationary period in her position as well as Warden uh, as Warden and Red Gramet. I think I misread some of that, which is sort of why it surprised me there. But, <clears throat> yeah, based on that, the key thing to take away is where is this comment? Where is any comment about the emotional? That's what we're all waiting for. If it's in further on, you know, I'll be a, a monkey's mm -hmm. uncle. But uh, this is all that I understand is that there's at least three um, descriptions of this meeting in Febu uh, February about the lockdown here. A meeting with Secretary Carr in early made statements. But there's also statements about Carr that she doesn't put in there. Uh, Carr is the one who first says it. Mac DeFessa Haya also says it. And... Uh, Miss Novak says it. So that's a serious problem that that would be omitted uh, from what I see here. Uh, let me know what you think. And as always, stick with us. We will keep you informed, I hope. Oh, I think that was